welcome everybody. Uh, today we have the great privilege of speaking to Dr. Paul Mason from Australia. Um, Paul, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a sports doctor from Sydney in Australia. Uh, I've been in the low-carb field for uh, several years now, and uh, I sort of fell into it uh, by chance. And uh, over the last several years, number of years now, I've been immersing myself in the science. And uh, the thing that surprises me is that uh, whenever I think that I'm starting to get a handle on things, Mm -hmm. I, something else totally comes across my bow that makes me realize we've, uh, this science still has a long way to go, but I, I get the feeling we're on the right track. Yep, absolutely. It's a nonstop learning experience. <laughs> As my family's like, you're reading another book about low carb? <laughs> another podcast? I'm like, yes, there's always something to learn. Uh, more oh. articles, more... The thing that excites me about it is we don't even have to go to the latest textbooks or anything like that. I'm actually learning from articles. I can go back to a journal from the 1950s or the 1960s and there's a hell of a lot of insights in a lot of the old literature that is just, you know, has effectively been lost and, you know, we're rediscovering it and it's much easier for us because we just have to read and luckily all these old articles are now indexed. So, you know, a good PubMed search will dig a lot of them up. But yeah. it's absolutely amazing how much of lost knowledge and the, what we consider a new discoveries is actually really old hat. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, it's, it's, it, we think we're reinventing, you know, it, we're, we're reinventing things, but really it's just all there or a lot of... Well, well you're an endocrinologist. <laughs> I mean... You know this better than anybody else. I mean, how was diabetes managed pre-insulin? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's uh, it's it's amazing because even today I had a patient uh, with uh, type one diabetes and and uh, the online or as I'm seeing patients now with telemedicine and the. Uh, they were just diagnosed and they're like, you know, we're told to eat anything we want, just cover it with insulin. And I'm like, here we are, so many years later. Uh, complications just increasing and, and let's uh, open our eyes and see how it could be done differently. So uh, well, I was, you know, just on this whole concept of just eat what you want. I mean, I was actually uh, on a, I'm in a, a few Facebook groups for doctors where there's several hundred doctors and I ended up in an exchange today. Um, and there were accusations about people talking about dietary management being guilty of fat shaming and so on and so forth. And the point that was made quite strongly was that uh, we, we sh by telling people that they should eat a certain way um, is actually gonna be causing them emotional distress and we shouldn't be doing that to our patients. And for me personally, we've got damn good evidence that eating a certain way will be healthier. I think it's actually akin to negligence, medical negligence, if we don't tell our patients this. And yet I ended up somehow in this online argument with some other doctors. And it wasn't just one isolated doctor who was saying, well, no, well, what if you tell them that they need to do this for the health? There was no argument that eating this way was good for diabetes. The argument was it would create cause emotional stress if they couldn't follow it. And I was just devastated by the, the ignorance. Well, I, I'm not sure what the what, correct way to encapsulate right. it is. But the norm has shifted so much, so much that, uh, that whatever we think is, is, uh, is normal now, uh, is, is actually quite sick. <laughs> As a... and, and, and the point I originally made was that we shouldn't be blaming the patient. We should be blaming the people who subject us to the dietary guidelines. Right, it's and, like freeing the patient. <laughs> and, and the amount of patients I've had who are eternally grateful for having had their lives turned around because they've, they've basically been subjecting themselves to you know, self-induced eating disorders and exercise excess and so on and so forth to try and maintain body weight on an unhealthy diet as per the dietary guidelines. And the gratitude when they actually say, you know what, it doesn't have to be hard. I can do this effortlessly. 
I can control my carbohydrate, my sugar control gets better, my weight goes away, and I'm not continuously hungry. And the, the most rewarding thing is that when people will describe to me their relationship with food, they say, I now have a good relationship with food. Mm. And, yeah. and for me, that's just so incredibly rewarding because the way you and I look at food is as a source of nourishment. Mm-hmm. a source of enjoyment. I sit down to every meal and I savour every goddamn bite. I, you know, I love it. But, and I know that it's healthy. Whereas previously, if you're sort of, you know, worried about your weight or what have you, or if you're in this different mindset, you don't look at food as a source of nourishment. You look at it as a source of calories that will make you fat. Right. And I mean, to sort of, go into a healthy diet and to be able to change that mindset, it's incredibly liberating. Oh, yeah, it's totally, totally liberating. Now, I just want to go back to something because you are a sports doctor, correct? Is this, yeah. this, is, your, this is your training. So do you, do you see people that, are, that you actually tell them tone down the sports? Uh, is that something that you find yourself saying now or is that well it's funny i mean what i used to do is um so i see a lot of overuse injuries so the classical case would be is i i I don't just treat elite athletes i also treat members of the general public Mm -hmm. and the classical patient would be a middle-aged female who comes in with a stress fracture and so the conversation and i know how this conversation is going to play out in my head as we start it's like Oh, so tell me about your activity. How often are you doing it? How far are you going? Okay. And we get out, okay, I'm walking 15,000 steps a day, you know, rah, rah, rah. Mm. And then the kicker, why? And sometimes they just look at me because they they know well that I know why. (laughs) But there's often this degree of awkwardness about admitting it. It's obviously for weight control. Why else does anybody exercise them into the ground while starving their body of nutrients so much that they develop stress fractures? If you're not an elite athlete training for a competition, why, you know, what need does, you know, the you know, average middle-aged female have for exercise to this degree? Except if that her only understanding of weight gain and weight loss is the calories in, calories out hypothesis. We just have to burn all of this off. And usually that then opens up and I say, well, you know, you've got a stress fracture, so you're going to have to curtail the activity. And that usually puts them into a a state of despondency because it's like, how on earth else am I going to be able to lose this weight? You know, you don't understand. If I don't walk for six hours a day, I'm going to keep putting on weight. This is the only possible way I've got of maintaining my current body weight. And then it's like, actually, no. Right you can't outrun a bad diet. doesn't matter what you do. It will always come up, catch up to you eventually. There's another way we can do this. And you don't have to be hungry. You don't have to starve yourself to do it. And to boot, those stress fractures, which are probably contributed to by poor bone health, you know, which can lead to osteoporosis, so on and so forth, right. we can actually reverse osteoporosis with nutrition. So, and... As an endocrinologist, you know full well about the drugs that we promote with the bisphosphonate drugs, which actually the way they work. So they actually impair bone turnover, which doesn't mean much to the general public. But to you, you know that if you have impaired bone turnover, you have bone that's vulnerable to fracture. We have these atypical fractures in the big thigh bone when people take these. In athletes who have been inappropriately given these for stress fractures, we end up basically, I've seen it end careers because they can never get over because it stays in the bones it, it stays there for at least 10 After years years and years bones. it's you know it's you know, it's just an awful drug and then we have other drugs which have side effects and this is our standard treatment for osteoporosis and we can reverse it well, so let's talk about that. What do you... randomized controlled trials it's been proven that you can reverse osteoporosis with nutrition and so when i tell these ladies you know we can improve your bone health and because it's usually ladies let's be um the men usually aren't so open men do suffer this um but i think to a lesser degree and i think a lot of that is the social stigma that's associated with it and women's magazines and so on and so forth Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back let's go back to these trials and what should we be telling patients 
to do to reverse their osteoporosis? Well, so let me tell you about this study. So it was from 2002. It was by a couple of researchers, Dawson and Hughes. So they looked at a, uh, a population over the age of 65, which to you says, well, that's got it. And half of them are females. And you're saying postmenopausal females, you've got no hope. We can't fix your bones. So they gave them uh, calcium uh, citrate and vitamin D as a supplement, blinded, randomized. Right. And they monitored their bone density with DEXA scanning. So pretty much gold standard. And then they got intelligent. They did a quirk. They said, we're going to stratify the, stu the study population by protein intake. So they, they put the study population into tertials based mm -hmm. on how much protein they were eating, um, lowest, middle, and highest. And they found that on, as assessed by DEXA scanning, over the course of three years, those participants having the highest protein intake with the vitamin D and calcium reversed their osteoporosis it's uh yes and 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 this is just this is not taught this is not taught to medical students this is not taught to specialists i i suspect that as an endocrinologist this is your bread and butter and that probably didn't form part of your training well that's for sure but let's go back to this the the, the calcium didn't make a difference it was only the protein that made the difference. Well, the calcium and vitamin, it was, so let's have a look at what bone is. So they're, they're all necessary because everybody thinks, okay, bone's made of calcium. You know what? Bone's actually more made of protein. Protein is the scaffolding upon which the calcium and other minerals can be inserted. And vitamin D just helps your body absorb calcium. So we sort of, you know, we, we use vitamin D and calcium interchangeably insofar as this goes. So let's think what happens if you have low calcium levels in your blood, your body's gonna go, well, I'm gonna break down the bone. I have to just break down the protein to get to the calcium to put a little bit of calcium in the circulation because we know that without enough calcium in the circulation, you can get problems. And then if you put a lot of calcium into the system, you reduce the body's need to break down bone. And that's what we've found over many, many years. If you give people calcium, you can slow down or you know, put a pause on the degradation of bone. But you can't make oh. new bone because you're missing the protein. That's so, but Although I, we, we have seen studies where giving calcium supplementation is just actually going to the arteries. So, well, this is the other problem, and this is what this other st this study didn't actually do, because it was done in 2002, and that was before we've got our current understanding of vitamin K2. Okay, so let's talk about that, yeah. So, uh, and uh, look, I'm sure you, you know this well. So, I mean, vitamin K2 is a fascinating supplement because uh, it, it hasn't been well known for a while. The Japanese were probably, the, the as a country, the first country to start taking it seriously. Which is interestingly because natto, which is fermented soy, is actually one of the, the foods which has got highest levels of it naturally. But it's also found naturally in cheese and it's also found naturally in pastured produce. Like pastured beef, what? Sorry? Produce, like meat, pastured, okay. so grass. Okay. okay. Uh, we say I'm speaking the Queen's English, but not really. <laughs> so, and so on a you know, if you're having a bit of dairy and these kind of things in your diet, you're getting vitamin K2. Right. And the problem is vitamin K2 has a role in helping, I, I guess, to tell calcium where to go. Does it end up in blood vessels or does it end up in your bone? And as you know, there's some uh, very good evidence that isolated calcium supplementation increases the risk of heart disease in females. Right. So certainly uh, I don't advocate for calcium supplementation. I think it's something that you probably should get from the diet. And you get it from a lot of food sources. People think you only can really get it from dairy. And there's a lot of dairy intolerant people. And I'll often use the example of, do you eat eggs? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's like, does a chicken have a skeleton? Well, the building blocks for that skeleton must be in the egg, right? So, I mean, from natural animal foods, we can get calcium. So, and you don't need to go having, you know, heaps of dairy. The, the natural food that has a lot of it is uh, the small fish with bones like sardines. Um, they're very rich in calcium as well. But if you're going to have calcium, you need to be making sure that you get a, uh, enough vitamin K2. And if we're talking about bone health as well, then magnesium is certainly beneficial. But 
the, the key point to this story is you cannot neglect the protein. And that's often something that is underdone. So the recommended daily range of protein is about 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, which is absolutely tiny. It, we've got studies where people actually have literally five times that amount without any detriment, as we can see on their, their biochemistry, their blood testing. Right. Um, routinely, we know that athletes, if we, you know, we've got studies where we give people already very high levels of protein, 1.8 grams per kilogram per day, and then we increase that to over three. And when we're having a look at their markers of muscle formation, we can see that that difference going up to three gave extra benefit. So oh, wow. okay. at the upper limit that we have on protein intake, is absolutely ridiculous. And this whole business about it being bad for the kidneys, well, it, it doesn't actually bear scientific scrutiny. It's never really been shown. And if we think about it logically, I mean, we, we have kidney problems, say something like glomerul, uh, glomer, I'll put my teeth back in now for a moment. Glomerulonephrosis, I always stumble over that one. But anyway, you're losing protein into the urine coming from the kidneys. Mm -hmm. So our response, as a medical profession to saying, well, you're losing lots of protein now in your, in your urine, you should eat less protein. Now, has anybody ever just stopped for one second? Like any medical student, when, when we're taught this, did we stop for a second and think, hang on, you're losing protein, so we give you less? Is that logical? It's interesting because the entire world is hooked on this, right? Everybody believes that eating too much protein hurts your kidneys. And that we really, we still need good trials for this. Well, in actual fact, we've got some pretty interesting stuff. So we know that, um, I mean, the kidneys is an organ, like the heart. If you exercise the heart, your heart gets bigger. It's called athlete's heart. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're, so we think that if you have a lot of you're eating a higher protein diet, your kidneys actually hypertrophy, the kidneys actually get larger. But that would suggest the kidneys actually have more functional capacity. So uh, I, I've, looked in, I've looked for research that could convincingly demonstrate harm of a high protein diet against kidneys and I'm yet to find it. Yeah, I haven't found it either. And even we've seen recently in mild kidney disease, the use of low carb diets and actually showing no effect. And in my practice, I actually see a decrease in protein excretion in the urine oh. when you actually use a low carb diet or ketogenic Massively. I mean, kidney health is so horribly misunderstood on a lot of lines. And I mean, so I mean, the function of the kidney, so we often look at what we call the EGFR, and I hope you don't mind if we get a little bit geeky. I mean, the estimated glomerular filtration rate. Right, um, which is essentially which is, the, the function of the kidney. How well does the kidney function? It's a measurement. Yeah. So normally when your doctor looks at your blood test and he has a, has a look at the, this number and says, yes, if it's in the reference range, your doctor will say, oh, your kidneys are fine. If it's not your kidney, you say, oh, you, know, you might have a problem. Now, first of all, the reference ranges we use on these tests are population averages. They don't reflect what good health is. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. But this EGFR, this is a calculated value and that can be errant uh, mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. So if you have a very low creatinine, you will get a, a good calculation on your EGFR, which means that if you're what we call sarcopenic, very, very wasted, right. your kidneys will look better than they actually are. Whereas right. if you're a muscular kind of guy, a lot of muscle, you'll have more creatinine, that will give you a reduced level of this. So we need to understand that these, some of the calculated blood values, this is almost like the Friedwald equation we use to um, guess what LDL levels is. We don't actually measure LDLs, we, we just guess it. Um, similar to kidney function, but measuring the amount of protein in the urine, now that's a good way of assessing kidney function. And I actually really like that because we do reliably see that it drops. And there's a number of lines of evidence that demonstrate that low carb diets where you cut the sugar out, you lower your blood sugar is actually beneficial. And if we take an example of a randomized trial, blinded study they done in diabetics, they give them a supplement called carnosine. Now mm -hmm. carnosine is basically two amino acids joined together. 
And it's what we call a glycation inhibitor because it attaches to the molecule of glucose and it stops that molecule of glucose then attaching to the cells of your body where it can damage them through glycation. Now, when we give diabetics this supplement, two amino acids, carnosine, we actually see that it actually reduces the protein in their urine and reduces the HbA1c, which is a blood marker of their average blood sugar level. So we know that, you know, kidneys are one of these first things that get whacked on the head when you're sick. Why are we using this more often? <laughs> well, my patients use it. <laughs> yeah, well, I should be using it too. <laughs> if I, so the, the literature, and this is not medical advice, but the doses used in the research is 500 milligrams twice a day, and it's called carnosine, C-A-R-N-O-S-I-N-E. And I would point something out that the Latin root for the word flesh is carn. So this is actually deficient in vegetarian diets. It doesn't come from, from non-flesh foods. And so this is why... Yeah, go ahead. So no, this no. is why vegetarians, more than anybody else, ought to be supplementing with this. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's very, very interesting what you just said. Very, very interesting. I, I, I think this is one of the issues that make this diet so hard to accept by the medical community. The, you know, the, the, the fear of the kidney. So we, we've, among um, other things, of course, num cholesterol being number one. But uh, so how do you handle the cholesterol issue? What do you... How do you well, actually, just talk about another pet peeve I have with the kidneys. Okay, so, please. So, and, and this is more from an athletic construct. And we seem to have this inability or this fear of letting people have concentrated urine. So as an athlete, we, we get them to pee on a urine dipstick and say, oh, it's not dilute enough. You must be dehydrated. And this whole fear of dehydration, which is just bunkum. And in actual fact, so... What we actually did, we did a study at the Australian Institute of Sport. Well, what they found was that by telling people to drink more so their urine was diluted in the morning, they, they had to drink so much that they'll wake up in the middle of the night to pee and the sleep disturbance was impacting their performance more than anything else. And what I actually tell people is, as you know, from medical school physiology, one of the first findings that the kidney is starting to lose its function, in addition to the the traces of protein is the loss of concentrated capacity. Basically means that your urine, normally you should sleep through the whole night, your kidneys are doing their job and it will have very concentrated urine of a small volume that you don't need to empty out overnight. If your kidneys start to fail, you, they can't effectively concentrate so you have to end up with much larger volumes which inevitable, inevitably will wake you up. So oh. this whole notion that you have to drink and keep your keep your urine clear and if your urine's not clear you've got a problem no the body well you know the body's smarter than that as um as i was told when i was a resident trying to calculate precise amounts of magnesium and potassium in intravenous fluids you know the, the dumbest kidney is smarter than the smartest intern oh, you know yeah. <laughs> the kidney does a wonderful job it, it's a uh... You know, especially what I'm thinking about the diluted urine uh, before before the patients go to uh, well, the, the diabetic, the ketogenic diet per se is already a dehydrating a diet in a way. So the question is, when the patients go to get their lab test, usually they have high BUNs, uh, you know, urea in the, in the urine. This is my experience, and I don't know if what maybe for you, you the BUN is 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 a different norm. Urea, so, so nitrate. So if I see the urea high, one, it could be because they're now eating more protein. And it's also because I have every single patient do the tests fasting. I actually believe a morning fasting test give more validity with, with better reproducibility. Right. Um, so I, I really have no issue um, with the, uh, you know, with a high bun, as it were. Um, I've never seen any issues with it. I tend to ignore it and I just reassure people. And there's other things that can go off. Uric acid will usually go up when you're on a, um, a ketogenic diet. And that's just because in the early stages, you burn all this fat and you produce these ketones, but the cellular machinery to use the ketones isn't active yet. 
So you have to get rid of the ketones. And so you urinate them out. And this is good if you're trying to lose weight because it's literally, you know, passing excess calories down the drain. So that's why you get this rapid weight loss in the first instance of starting a ketogenic diet. But normally uric acid is secreted by the kidneys as well. So the ketones will actually compete with the uric acid. So more ketones coming out means that some of the uric acid has to stay in the body. So your uric acid levels will go up. And when I'm looking at blood tests, I can tell if somebody's recently started the ketogenic diet and if they were compliant, because I'll see a rise in the uric acid. And then reliably within a few months, that will be absolutely back at baseline. And that tells me that they are then fully keto adapted. Or even lower. I usually see it over time go lower than their baseline. Um, uh, can do, and but, and it, but it can take up to three months. Yes. Which With tells us, which is why if you're an athlete um, trying to perform, you know you need to persist. There's no point doing a ketogenic diet for two weeks and saying, oh, this didn't work, I, I didn't get a PB. Um, the, the process of proper keto adaptation, which the elite athletes are using to literally set world records, they're, they're in it for long-term, six months more. Right, right. Steve Finney. As, uh, exactly. I mean, Steve Finney, Jeff Follick, those guys are the doyens. They they pioneered the research in this field. And to be fair, they just didn't do the pioneering research. They're still pushing on the boundaries now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but back to the uric acid question, because um, uric acid is also a marker of heart disease, right? Um, and I am wondering, if there's some... Uh, debate out there if, if maybe we shouldn't be using allopurinol, aller, what, is, what is the, this is the Hebrew word for it, uh, allopurinol, uh, to treat uh, the high uric acids. Um, what, so what this, is a bit of a, this is a bit of a tricky situation because uric acid can actually be intracellular or extracellular. And depending on where it is, it can be pro-oxidant or antioxidant. And I'm not sure of what we measure, whether we actually get a full assessment of what we're measuring. We certainly know that, you know, with conditions like gout, where the uric acid can form crystals, um, basically they're like little needles that will sort of, you know, form inside the joint. And you can imagine if you had a bunch of needles stabbing the inside of the joint, not good. That's basically what gout is. Um, so uric acid is a, also a potent antioxidant. So... Yeah. I think we need, to, we need to be very clear about what we're measuring and that uric acid is not just uric acid and depending on exactly where it is in relation to the cell, it could be more positive or, or more deleterious. And uh, for me personally, um, so you mentioned allopurinol. So allopurinol is a drug which inhibits something called xanthine oxidase, which is in the, uh, the purine pathway. And one of the interesting things about this, I'm sorry, I'm gonna geek out again a little bit, but um, there's two steps in this, uh, this purine pathway, uh, which is uh, produce something called uh, superoxide, which is a, an antioxidant type molecule. So some people are actually, I actually did some research on this in a, a bunch of ultra marathoners a few years ago. So I'm familiar with the pathways where we were actually, we looked at the pathways and we thought if we gave these people uh, allopurinol, we might be able to actually reduce their levels of oxidative stress. And we were measuring some of the substances uh, in their blood, like malondialdehyde and some other things, trying to assess their lipid oxidation rates. At the end of the day, our study was underpowered, and I, I suspect it's probably a, it probably won't do any good. Um, but we certainly we never got any resolution on the question of whether it was a pro, uh, a positive effect or a negative effect of using allopurinol. And I, I don't know that anybody has actually got the answer right now, but I haven't looked at the research for a couple of years on that. So it, I don't know if you all have come across anything more recently. Um, I was, uh, I think Rick Johnson um, has written a lot about this. And my impression was that we want really low uric acid levels and that um, allopurinol was quite an effective way of getting there. But, you know, then again, it's a drug and we have other ways of lowering things, uh, including the a low carb diet. So um, I, I think more than anything, I use it as a marker of, uh, of metabolic disease. So well, the I, simple I, fact I is, aware of the, the antioxidant, uh, uh, on a healthy diet, we don't need it. I mean, the, the, the one reason it's given, or the, but the major reason it's given, is for gout. Of course. Uric acid 
And even, even though a, a lot of doctors, as you know, will diagnose gout based on the serum uric acid level over a certain threshold. And that is absolutely the wrong thing to do because the, the, the pretest probability and the, the sensitivity specificity of that is absolutely horrendous. Right. But doctors, I'm sure, I don't know if they're like doctors in Australia. <laughs> I can tell you for a fact, doctors in Australia, I will still get the occasional correspondence. I'm flicking through a patient's file and I'll see a comment about high uric acid and gout. And it's like, <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's just so far more complex than uh, people want to want to make it out to be. It sure seems that way. I also, um, which brings me to think about vitamin C, because vitamin C, um, I was reading that this actually is an effective way of uh, decreasing uric acid levels um, as well. So I don't know if that, uh, and now vitamin C seems to be very popular with uh, Corona. Um, yeah, look, people are talking about, you know, a, a, massive doses of intravenous vitamin C being an antioxidant that can potentially help. And I, I haven't seen enough data that has sold me on it. I mean, I was doing some reading today about the cytokine storm and how important this uh, cytokine called interleukin-6 is in the whole process. And that can lead to some consequences that as a part of it can lead to oxidative damage. But the interesting thing is, is that interleukin-6, which is the major driver for C-reactive protein, as you know, which is a marker of inflammation, interleukin-6 is actually associated with metabolic syndrome, with insulin resistance, with obesity. And um, well, there have actually been some really neat studies. They did one in Nature last year, uh, it was published last year, where they actually followed people up for a long period of time and they looked at 41 different elements in their blood whenever they had a viral infection. And they actually found that their cytokine level at the start of the infection between people who were healthy and people who were insulin resistant was the same. But those people, and these cytokines include things like interleukin-6. But she had this lovely apple tree. The apples, that big, not that sweet. And, and they were, everybody loved them you know that heaven forbid you know that the, the tree was covered in curtains and all that to keep the birds out i mean everything was done because that was precious cargo that was fruit so we haven't realized now that the fruit we have today they're mutants they mm. they have no resemblance to the fruit that we've evolved with Absolutely. they they're, they're just full of sugar this fructose is actually far worse um so People talk about fructose being fruit sugar, by the way, which we have to correct. It is not all sugar in fruit is fructose. Um, on average, it's probably about 50-50, but some fruits have higher percentages of fructose, some have less. So fruit usually has a mix of fructose and glucose, but the fact that it has fructose in it is particularly deleterious to our health. So we've had these, historically, we've had fruits that have been a lot smaller and we've had fruits that have been seasonal. Yeah. It's only, you know, the fruit's only in, you know, ripe for, you know, a matter of weeks every year. Now we get to gorge on it year round. It's much like honey. You know, yeah. it, go to the supermarket now, buy a jar of honey. Fantastic. Easy. Well, think how it was for some of our ancestors who said, there's a beehive, go get the honey. <laughs> not, <laughs> not that hungry. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to get stung today. I mean, so these things about natural foods being particularly healthy, they do have a role. They have had a role uh, in terms of, you know, perhaps you fatten yourself up before winter or mm -hmm. something like this. It, it's much very similar to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance has a natural physiological role, as you know. If you're going through puberty, that's a stage of insulin resistance because that's where, especially if you're a female, you need to be getting some fat stores or pregnancy. That's another state, uh, natural physiological state of insulin resistance. But aside from that, we don't need this insulin resistance. And if you're going to be gorging on these sugary treats year round, you know what? You're going to be insulin resistant your whole life, not just through puberty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's the, the fruit is very tricky because it is natural and then and really throws people off. So along those lines, I want to pick your brain on something that um, I think about quite a bit, and which is um, 
there's there's the thinking that metabolic syndrome is caused by basically overpassing your personal fat threshold. Basically, no more space within your fat cells, and then things start to spill over. Um, that I think that's one way of looking at the beginning of insulin resistance. Um, another way is to say um, it's actually the fructose that's caught wreaking havoc in the liver. And when you remove the fructose, actually the insulin resistance goes away. Um, I think that they're both coexisting. Both things happen at the, are, are present, but I, but I still wonder what is the, the, um, the more prominent the root uh, cause. Yeah. I think I agree with you that they're both happening at the same time. But I, I think if I had to pick a causative mechanism, a root cause, I think it has to come back to the liver. And some of the other justifications, we know the toxic effects of fructose in the liver. Um, I mean, and there's several reasons for this. It's because the fructose cannot be stored as glycogen. It doesn't have that, that blow off valve, if you will, where you can actually take a certain amount of it out of the equation. Where you have fructose, it's gonna be processed um, metabolically by the liver. And if you exceed the processing capacity, then you, you stimulate de novo lipogenesis and fat formation in the liver. But the other line of evidence, which I find really interesting, is the fact that when we have oxidized oils, these oxidized oils will directly damage the liver and they appear to directly contribute to insulin resistance as well. And so that's actually, that's not an effect that's happening in the periphery, uh, the subcutaneous fatty tissues or anything at all like that. Um, and, you know, as we understand more and more about these other, you know, fancy chemicals like retinol binding protein four and these kind of things, and we've got these electron micrographs of, you know, oxidation damage in the livers of, of rodents. Um, I think that the data is now becoming uh, much more clear that it, the liver is the organ that we have to be looking after. But the beautiful thing is, as we said before, you know, the fact that you lose around the organs and the, the stuff within the liver, that is fat that disappears very quickly uh, when you you know, when, when you go on a healthy diet and lose weight. So even if you start out at 120 kilograms and you lose 10 kilograms, you're still quite overweight. But I can promise you there's a very good chance that you, well, you know, if you're not metabolically healthy, you will be on your way to being metabolically healthy if we were to measure things like insulin resistance and glucose levels. It only takes a, uh, a rather modest amount of weight loss for people to start getting these metabolic gains. And I don't know if you concur, but my feeling is it's all about the liver. Yeah, it's it's uh, it to me the liver is I don't know how to partition it because I I still the the personal fat threshold theory or uh, you know I guess there's enough evidence to, to show this is also happening. So I don't I just don't know what is more important. But I but clearly it's an not, endocrinological origin. You know, we, we do have, you know, I mentioned interleukin-6 before, which leads to CRP, you know. We know that comes from adipocytes. Yeah, that's what I mean. So you, you kind of have to have both in a way. But also what we do see is that even, even if there's zero weight loss, even I, if I don't have any weight loss on the scale, I still see improvements in metabolic uh, markers. And I, and I think that's happening because we can't, we're not measuring the fat in the liver, but somehow it's, it doesn't have to be that much to see it in effect. Um, oh, yeah. And we, we see this with exercise too. So we know that exercise is really terrible for losing weight. But when we do these DEXA scans on people, body composition scans, what we do see is a redistribution of fat. Mm. So we actually know that exercise, absolutely. Now, while we, I you know, make the term, you can't outrun a bad diet for weight loss. It's absolutely rubbish. But for metabolic health, exercise is remarkable. And let's be fair, if it wasn't for exercise, you know, well, all of our athletes, who by definition are exercising, they'd be diabetic much earlier. So we have guys like uh, Tim Noakes, who was on an incredibly high carb diet, you know, he was the inventor of these energy gels. You know, he, 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 uh, he knew more about carb loading than anybody. Yeah. Um, and he probably did it better than anybody as well. Um, he would have probably turned up as a type two diabetic decades earlier, were it not for his marathon runnings. 
yeah, on the flip side, it may not have been carbo loading if it weren't for the mass sunlight shining. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, <laughs> <that's true>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that. so uh, yeah, it's it's an, it's a, just an interesting question because uh, in in the end, the treatment is the same. It doesn't really matter, right? If, as far as the patient is concerned, if they just stop carbs and sugars, then they're going to see. Well, I think the interesting thing is, I mean. There's two other pieces of evidence that would point to it being more hepatic driven rather than subcutaneous fat driven. And that's the concept of TOFI, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. We see these people who are quite lean looking and yet they're metabolically unhealthy when we measure their insulin levels and their glucose. And, and so don't on. they so have fat? Don't they have fat anyway? Just not, uh, I mean, I was under the understanding that visceral fat was still prominent in TOFI. No? Oh, exactly. Exactly. But the visceral fat is the stuff that affects the liver. I see. I see. That's what you're... And okay. I see. Can't so, separate visceral fat from liver fat. I see. Okay. Well, I guess in my mind, what confuses me is that you can have... Let, let's... Uh, in, in my mind, you the, the carbs come in, the liver takes the, the novo lipogenesis, the, the glucose gets converted to, to fat, or the fructose gets converted to fat much faster, and then it gets shipped out into the fat cells, as long as there's room for holding it in the fat cells. If, there's, if, we, if we don't have any more space, then, uh, then it stays in the liver. This is kind of my, my thinking about this. Is that, do you agree with that statement or not quite? I, I honestly don't know. Um... That's what, I, I, that's what I'm trying to tease out. I don't know either. And it would be interesting, that, and I don't know, but I will postulate a question, is if you were to have a diet rich in sugar but free of oils, free of oxidative stress, although that, that's impossible because blood sugar fluctuations have been shown to lead to the generation of oxidative stress from mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So it would be very hard to eliminate oxidative stress from the equation. Although um, you look at the Chinese, right? The Chinese before sugar was part of uh, their diet and they had a lot of carbs, but without the sugar and they didn't have disease. So. Yeah. Another interesting line of evidence is melatonin, which is a potent antioxidant. So most people don't realize that that's in the pineal circulation in the brain associated with circadian rhythms. Um, potent antioxidants. So they've got blinded studies where supplementing people with five milligrams or 10 milligrams twice a day reversed fatty liver disease. Yeah, I heard about this. That's fascinating. Do you uh, use that, that? I do. do. Absolutely. Do. Um, so, I mean, I think that, look, the best thing is to reduce oxidative stress. And a couple of drivers of oxidative stress are fluctuating blood sugar levels, cut out the carbs and any, any liquid fats, so oils. Um, they basically oxidize. So they, if you can cut both of those out, then fine. You probably don't need it. But some people, you know, for whatever reason, they have lifestyle reasons. They live with families. They've got cultural reasons. They're still going to keep eating crap foods. And those kind of patients, I'll say, well, let's do a bit of risk mitigation here. And, you know, melatonin twice daily is certainly, you know, up there with carnosine for uh, one of the good supplements. Wait, melatonin twice daily? Did you just say? Yeah, correct. So, and people are worried, oh, won't it zonk me out in the morning? It doesn't seem to have that effect. Yeah, so I mean, it's obviously known as a sleep promoter. Um, but, I, and I based my dosing off the science because that was the, uh, that was what the studies that have shown improvements have used. So I think that's my justification. And very rarely will I have anybody tell me that it affects them. And interestingly, the people who tell me it affects them tend to be those guys who I suspect have sleep apnea. So I think that's just daytime somnolence from another cause. Right. Which actually brings me on to another uh, quasi-interesting topic related to visceral fat. So the cause of sleep apnea, I mean, we used to just think it was the bull neck and all the fat around the airways here. It's actually the tongue. The tongue gets fat. The tongue gets fat, yeah. I was chatting to a... Uh, a butcher a while back and he was describing to me um, Wagyu beef and he's saying if you have a look at a, a really expensive Wagyu tongue 
is saying if the marbling, you can see it right through the tongue and compare it to a normal beef tongue and there's absolutely nothing going on there at all. And we've got some MRI studies now where we've actually looked at the size and the fat distribution in people's tongues before and after weight loss. And you can actually see that the space in the airway just clears. So what's actually happening in people in sleep apnea is that when they're falling asleep, the muscles, the tone around the airways that helps keep the airways open, that relaxes a little bit. And if you've basically got this massive lobular tongue in there, then there's no room, a little bit of relaxation and your airways occluding. And the big problem is, as you know, people aren't always conscious of the waking. So the airway occludes, they have a deoxygenation in their, their blood. So they get this arousal of their brain that just triggers them, sympathetic activation, just enough to say, oh, you better you know, tighten up the airway a little bit. We need to get some air through. Um, so it's a partial awakening, but a lot of people aren't actually conscious that they're waking. They might be waking you know, tens of times every hour. Like They're just never getting into a deep sleep. They just feel absolutely awful. And this sleep deprivation also has impacts and you'll know full well about the impacts that sleep deprivation has on leptin and ghrelin, two hormones essential for energy homeostasis. So you can sort of see that you get this cycle, you get overweight and that leads to other effects that has this feed forward effect that dysregulate these hormones and causes you to gain more weight. And it's very difficult to break this cycle. And I was absolutely fascinated when this study came out and we could actually see the tongue literally shrinking in size. And funnily enough, the, the conclusion of this paper was that perhaps we should be thinking about therapies that shrink the tongue. Maybe we could do cryotherapy and burn the fat and these kind of things. And I was like, oh. so they, so you, you demonstrated that you could shrink the tongue with weight loss. And then you demonstrated that that shrinking of the tongue led to massive improvements in sleep apnea. So the conclusion is that let's treat sleep apnea by, you know, maybe surgery or something to a tongue. <laughs> I mean, you see that all the time, right? Like you read something, it's so logical, and then the conclusion is let's give him medication for it. I, I, I mean, it really beggars belief. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but it's nothing new. I mean, this is what... It's really easy to understand why the public is losing faith in doctors. Yeah, yeah. But it's because it's you just to... parrot this stuff back out. Yeah. But I sorry, I want to come back to, uh, to the sleeping because I'm curious to hear what you you know what you use for sleeping. The sleeping is so crucial to metabolic health. Period. So what mm. are what aids do you use? So clearly, in melatonin. Well, so quite honestly, I think. Basic hygiene measures, sleep hygiene. I don't mean wash your hands. I mean, yeah, wash your hands, coronavirus. But <laughs> when we talk about sleep hygiene, we talk about simple things. So the first and obvious one is I say to people, what time do you go to bed? And if they can't tell me a time, it means they don't have a regular bedtime. Mm -hmm. Or it means they're embarrassed because they know it's too late. <laughs> so here's the thing. If I fly from here to Hong Kong, it's like three, four hours difference. I know that that will be enough to upset my body clock, right? Three hours is enough to upset my body clock. And some people will go to bed at nine o'clock one night and midnight another night. And they'll regularly have these fluctuations on a week to week basis. We know that if you go traveling somewhere, it takes about three weeks for your body clock to, to reset itself fully if you go on a, uh, you know, a, a transatlantic flight, for instance. So if you're constantly every night or two nights changing your, your bedtime, your body is in a constant state of discombobulation. Uh, you need the same bedtime. And then you need to give yourself enough time in bed. This business about, you know, I can get away on seven hours sleep. Yeah, you can probably get away on it, but you're not going to be functioning optimally. So, and I could point you to a lot of studies, but I, I won't bore you with the details. I'll just say it's got to be eight hours. Let's just, let's exactly. just accept you've got to have eight hours. And let's also accept that if you spend eight hours in bed, you're not sleeping for eight hours. So you need to allow a bit of fat on the bone. So maybe spend eight and a half hours in bed. That would okay. be a good point. Now let's also understand that the part of the body clock, the circadian rhythm that is most rigid is the time you wake up. You often just wake up at the same time any day. That's hard to control. So, you know, on a weekend, you're tired as you've canceled the alarm and you still wake up at 6.30 or seven o'clock and you want to sleep, but you can't. 
So if you need to sleep longer, you have to go to bed earlier. You can't rely on sleeping in longer. So that's a very simple rule. Just pick this, pick when you are going to wake up, go back eight and a half hours. That's your new bedtime. And that is a strict bedtime every night with no little variation. A lot of people will be, they, they just need to be told and they need to be told quite explicitly because Skype and Netflix and these kind of things, they eat into our sleeping hours. Then we have some, you know, things like um, temperature. People don't realise that the optimal sleeping temperature is about 19 degrees C. That's actually really cold. That's really cold. So, um, <laughs> but you get a nice doona, that's a perfect temperature to sleep in. They've got studies that show this repeatedly. And then if you share the bed with a partner, share do, don't use the same doona. Have two separate doonas. You know, you can have Thomas the Tank on one and, you know, Frozen on the other one or what have you, his and hers. But this is something I was first introduced in Scandinavia and it makes a hell of a lot of sense um, because, it, you know, it puts an end to these doona wars. And at night time, I mean, you, you're all about the hormones. So you all know all about these bright lights suppressing melatonin secretion. So after, at night, after a certain time, there is no overhead lights on. It's only lamps and I prefer to have red lamps. And, uh, you know, if you've got to get up to, you know, feed a child or something like that in the middle of the night, well, you can have red globes that are even better than just low wattage globes. So red light, it doesn't really suppress your melatonin as much at all. You know, put these, uh, put filters on your phone, and your screens and things like that. So there's a hell of a lot of things that we can do just around our habits of sleep you know, focusing on temperature, habits, exposure to light, separate dunas, that actually, for most people, will significantly improve their sleep. And because I really don't like drugs. So beyond melatonin, all these ones that we call the, the Zs or Zoficlone or Zolpidem or these kind of ones, they're, uh, you know, they have, they can induce what we call parasomnias and people acting out their dreams and they have side effects. Yeah, um, yeah. We have the benzodiazepine class, which are, you know, like the same receptors as alcohol and they tend to be addictive. They tend to, uh, uh, you know, habit forming and they lose their effectiveness over time as well. So people end up dependent on them and they don't end up with any benefit. So from a pharmacological perspective, sleep is really a, a dead end. There, there's no effective strategies that we have long term. Um, melatonin can help. Uh, and I would certainly say that the, a lot of the science on melatonin would suggest that uh, the homeopathic doses which we have in Australia are probably not that effective and people probably need larger doses. So when I say the homeopathic doses, um, the, the only commercial dose that you can get in Australia is two milligrams, I which uh, I don't know what you think, but for my money, that's probably inadequate. Yeah, well, there's a, a slow release formulation here of two uh, milligrams that doesn't show effects until about a month later. So we, we do right. see that. Um, but uh, uh, definitely you're not going to see any uh, effect anytime soon. So Actually, one question I'd like to ask you as an endocrinologist. Uh, I do recall from medical school that melatonin signaling was involved in the onset of puberty. I don't mm -hmm. know if... Uh, and there was a, a theoretical, uh, you know, we we're, were just advised to not use it in anybody under the age of 18. I don't know if there's been any further advances there. I don't know anything about that, but I can tell you that I never heard of melatonin when I was in medical school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, certainly I know that, uh, well, if you think about the, it's a huge change in, in the patterns of sleeping in teenage years. So something must be going on there. Um, who knows? Actually, one interesting thing that I would, would be cool to talk about is um, I have a couple of patients, type 1 diabetics, mm -hmm. who suddenly go on these crazy escalating doses of insulin without any real understanding why. And when I look into it, it's sort of the most likely culprits appear to be uh, antibodies. So antibodies against insulin or antibodies against the insulin receptor. But you know what? It's really difficult to get a, a test for that in Australia. If we actually want to get that tested, we have to send it to the US or to the UK. And it's prohibitively expensive for the most part. So I don't know if you have that issue. I mean, in the literature, when that happens, 
it seems to be actually really rare. Developing antibodies used to happen a lot more when we use porcine insulin, but now it's, it's not that common. We sh it's kind of interesting that you're seeing that. I mean, this is something that- I've only seen it a couple times. Okay. But, uh, and probably because I see a lot of diabetics. Um, okay. But I definitely, you know- It's I've more common for sure. But now we shouldn't be seeing that unless there's a specific reason. Sometimes you see a mismatch, or, or if they're long, these are long-term diabetics, people who've been type one for a really long time. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, when we say a long time, five, six years, you know, th these are sort of, you know, semi-pediatric patients. I see. I mean, the, the development of antibodies is very, very rare, and usually ends up presenting with a mix of hypo and hyper uh, insulin. They can actually also get hypos because the the is that depending on if the antibody is against the receptor, it might be an activating antibody? Exactly. Or, um, it, it, or it could be binding to the insulin and then releasing. So then you have peaks and troughs that are not uh, so clear. But these are very rare cases. Extremely right, okay. Rare. And so, then, well, the problem is that knowing how to manage it is a headache. A headache. <laughs> a headache yes. You look I mean, at the pathways of it, there's, hard, there's nowhere really to go. I, I, are you using NPH still in Australia? Is that your main insulin or you're using the longer acting, uh, um, you know, Lantus? I couldn't actually, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of formulations. Uh, I, I'm actually, I'm not an endocrinologist. So I don't prescribe the initial insulin. Okay. So I, I normally, my job is not to prescribe the insulin, but to get them off of it. <laughs> right. Well, It'd be interesting to try a very, very low carb diet in these patients and see what happens. I mean, these so hard immune are... response will improve. Put him on a carnivore diet and see what happens. <laughs> well, finally, you should mention that. But this is how we actually know that I can actually be so confident that there probably is an antibody response because when they're on a tight diet and you start having these, we're literally seeing tenfold increases in insulin requirements in the space of six months. And it's like, you know, this is not normal. Whoa, wait a second. Say that again. We're literally seeing tenfold increases in insulin in the space of six months. I mean, this is on when you when you uh, when you stop the diet. No, no, when they're, oh. when they're on the stable diet. Oh, on, the, on a stable diet. I see. And they're, they're already they're already sticking to the diet. I mean, the interesting thing is that we we see a lot of um, the, the the natural amount of insulin that some people need, even the type one diabetics is actually really small. You know, we see that what the basal requirement is something like 30 units a day. No, well, the number of, less, yeah. I know the number of patients who are on way less than that. Yeah, well, no, the requirements in general should be between 0.3 and 0.5 uh, units per kilogram per day. So if you have- uh, oh, Insulin sensitive. Yes, exactly. So the type one supposedly are insulin sen sensitive. So yeah. that, that's what I aim for. I aim for about 0.3 because you want, you, you want the lowest amount of insulin also for type 1s, right? So, sure. So uh, I, 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 and you can achieve that. You know, there are patients that have been long-term diabetics who end up eight, nine units a day of, of basal, no problem. Some that we even get down further. But, um, and, th and that's a level where you're not going to be in having too much insulin re resistance. I mean, you're going to be basically having perfect health, normal lifespan with that. I, I, I believe so. I think uh, um, we, we've really seen that type 1s are subject to the, the same problems as type 2s, right? Uh, they, they, if they eat whatever they want, coming back mm. to the beginning of the conversation, then they're going to gain weight. But it's going to be even worse because they have high basal levels all day long. So yeah. all the, you know, in a very, not just when they eat and then have a dip down to it, like even insulin resistant people have decreases in insulin between meals to some, to some extent, but type ones don't. If, if they're on high basal levels, then they're high yeah. for very long, you know, very long periods of time. And that- I was that intrigued happens. you mentioned carnivore diet. Yes. I mean, personally, I think uh, an elimination diet for a disease that is autoimmune in nature makes sense. So have you had any patients who have done that? Um, you know, I have not um, treated patients with a carnivore diet in order to get rid of their type one. 
Yeah. But what I have done is uh, I have a number of patients, and I know I should publish this, but um, just haven't gone around to it. But we have uh, about 10 patients who presented with type 1 diabetes, were on insulin, but fairly recently diagnosed, and then you put them on a ketogenic diet, but not carnivore, and then uh, are able to be off insulin already for years. And, um, and I, I think that's really exciting. And, and I think people should know that it's worth trying. Uh, well, there are, there are case studies. I mean, looking at the autoimmune protocol and stuff, we, we basically lectin elimination diets mm -hmm. where you basically get incredibly prolonged honeymoon phases in type one diabetics. Yeah, I, I've seen some of these. So I, ha so I haven't tried getting rid of all the, all the lectins, but uh, it's, it's certainly on my mind. It's just, uh, it's uh, something that, that we really should look into. I, are you are for you, another day, but you know, I'm, I certainly, I check all of my type two. And when I say type two, I, all of my, every patient gets an antibody screen. So glutamic acid, decarboxylase, islet cell antibodies, and you know, zinc eight transport, all these kind of ones. Okay. And frequently these guys who are clear cut type two diabetics are not clear cut type two diabetics. They have, you know, as you know, LADA, the late autoimmune diabetes uh, of adulthood. Right, right. And I'm actually, and I certainly believe that people with that autoimmune component, I don't think a ketogenic diet is optimal for them. I think you really need to go on a low lectin diet as well. Um, and it just makes sense. I mean, if you've got, you know, type two, you know, type phenotype of insulin resistance, and then you've got the type one stuff where your pancreas is being smashed by your immune system, um, you know, and what do you heading. see? What do you see when you eliminate the lectins in the, in this latter population? So, just generally a much tighter glucose control. Um, it is, so, some people on a ketogenic diet, they still struggle with their sugar controls, mm -hmm. and there's something about going on a low lectin diet that then improves that significantly, even over and above what a what a lectin what a, uh, a low carb diet will. And we also know that wheat germ and gluten and concavalin and, and a you know, other lectins have actually been demonstrated to bind to insulin receptors and to stimulate de novo lipogenesis and have these other effects as well. So anywhere where you think that you might have a, a lectin problem, and I think there's no better suggestion of that than having antibodies and autoimmune issue, um, cut out the lectins and see what happens. It, it's absolutely quite fascinating that, you know, they've got studies where in animals admittedly, but when they, you know, they give them lectins, they gain weight. <laughs> Their sugar control worsens. They take the lectins away, um, things get better. Yeah, yeah. I actually heard you say that before. Very interesting. It really is fascinating. It's just so hard to get people on a ketogenic diet to then take away the lectins. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's very, it's, <laughs> practically speaking, it's hard. But like you said, socially, socially speaking, I mean, if you tell somebody, oh, you know, why don't you just try and eat meat for a while? I mean, that's not going to go down well, I'm guessing. <laughs> and what else? <laughs> well, no, just meat. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I have to admit that I tried uh, being carnivore uh, over the last month and it's been a challenge. It was, it's been quite the challenge. So uh, I, I have a lot of respect for the people who can do it. Is that it. pure carnival? Well, yeah, I tried. Not, I didn't last the whole month, but I, okay. I really... So coffee or anything like that? Cheese? Eggs? You know, what, 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 what kind of carnival? No, I mean, it was, one of, let's say, a carnivore light, okay? Carnivore light. But, uh, but really, I tried to take away all the vegetables, most of the cheeses. and um, mm. So I wasn't uh, pure, but the thing is, I really don't have a motivator for to do it because I, I, my labs are okay and I'm fine. And I'm, but uh, but I, I I just wanted to try for the fun of it to see what uh, what am I telling my patients to do? Like how hard is this? And yeah. I, and it is. I think it's pretty hard. But uh, I have a lot of patients coming in and telling me they're carnivore, and then listing all the uh, the foods that they eat. And it seems to be a common misunderstanding that. If you, you know, if you eat meat, you must be carnivore. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I understand that I'm that only I will be carnivore. Right, right. I mean, some people are going, uh, uh, oh, yeah, I'm carnivore. I eat meat. Um, that's sort of not how it works. 
<laughs> no, no. But listen, I was eating much more liver than I ever tolerated. And, uh, and you know, to get rid of vegetables is not easy. But, uh, but here's a, I got a question for you. What, why were you eating liver? It, it sounds like it wasn't your favorite food. That's true. But, you know, I, I feel, I felt like with the Corona, I wanted all the, all the vitamins and all the, all, everything I needed, I think is in liver. So I thought, you know, eggs and liver, eggs and liver. <laughs> yeah. What, what uh, you don't agree with that? You don't think liver is a superfood? I don't, I don't have a strong opinion on it. I, I, I know that a lot of people do, you know, say that nose to tail and so on and so forth. I, I don't think you need to go chasing liver. If you don't like it, I, I think there's plenty of, uh, you know, people out there who are in great health who don't eat offal, who don't eat the, uh, the odds and ends of the animal. And certainly if we have a look at the nutrient analysis of things, and you mentioned eggs. I mean, eggs is nature's multivitamin. You know, you, you know as we said before, it's got a whole functioning organism that comes out of it. You know, there, there can be nothing left wanting from a nutrient perspective from an egg yolk. So I think if you, you know, you're having enough foods like that, the nutrient density of animal foods by and large is so much more than plant foods anyway. Uh, I don't think that you have to have liver, right. you know, to pop it up. And for me yeah, personally, I, I don't eat a lot of liver. Yeah, well, I w it was it was kind of an experiment for me. <laughs> I just yeah. I wanted, I wanted to to see if I could learn to like it, but, and I kind of did. But but uh, I think um, I don't know. I'm I think I'm a little bit afraid of stopping all vegetables if you don't have internal organs. I think uh, you you need to complement that. Well, no, well, but th this is a common theme um, because, and what it really shows is that the level of indoctrination that we've had mm -hmm. from these dietary guidelines that tell us that vegetables are an essentially healthy food. And mm -hmm. if you actually sit down and you, you go and do a Google search and you say, okay, what nutrients are in vegetables? What, what nutrients are in vegetables that I can't get from meat? you're going to have a very short list because it's not going to have anything on it. So if you have a look for essential nutrients in veggies that you can't get from animal foods, there's none. There, there, there is literally none. Hmm. So, I mean, it, but this is the problem. I mean, it's almost like a religious indoctrination. You, you, once it's in your head, it's almost impossible to get out. We've been force fed this, this notion that, fruits and vegetables are incredibly healthy foods. Right. And but the, what, the, about, what about the, 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 the soup broth? This, what is your feeling? Bone about? broth, bone broth. I don't do that. I don't do that. So here's the thing about bone broth. You know, if you've ever made a bone broth, you'll see all this sediment at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. And most people I know won't drink that sediment. And that's where it's at? Where do you think all the minerals and all everything is there? You know, when they've actually, you know, they do an analysis on a typical bone broth, looking at the potassium and stuff like that, it's actually not that high. It's, it, there's nothing particularly special about bone broth, unless you're spooning in, you know, that sediment at the bottom, which, you know, just imagined as having a bit of crunchy gravel, you know, it, it's not, doesn't appeal to me. And I'm a bit of a hedonist. I, I eat what I feel like. I eat what I want. I eat what gives me pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be honest, that doesn't, the thought of that doesn't fill me with joy. <laughs> well, interesting. I, I, but I will tell you this, just the soup broth, okay, not, it doesn't have to be like the, the religious bone broth, okay, but it just the chicken soup, I find in my practice makes a huge difference. I'm telling you, I, I can see exactly who, who drank the soup broth and who didn't in the first two weeks. Okay, they, here's one. Here's why. So you mentioned before that the ketogenic diet is a dehydrating diet. Yeah. So it's because in the kidneys, there's four transporters that tell the body to hold on to sodium and they are all stimulated by insulin. You go on a ketogenic diet, that is a salt wasting, a sodium wasting state. Your body loses sodium. You lose sodium, you lose volume because sodium is what holds the water in it, what attracts the fluid. So that's how a ketogenic diet is a dehydrating diet. So if you're having a chicken broth, a, a, you know, chicken soups or what have you, there's a lot of sodium in that. 
that is basically correcting a sodium deficiency that reliably occurs when people start a ketogenic diet until their kidneys figure it out. Yeah, no, no, of course. And it's, uh, but it's just amazing to see the results. I mean, it's just a, a before and after. But it's, it's, there's something magical to this. It's not, not, it's not just adding salt to the meat or et cetera. There, there, there's, there's, I guess, the combination of the fluid plus the salt. But uh, well, there might be potassium in there as well. It might be a mix of electrolytes. If we have a look at some of the studies, so um, Steve Finney, when they, they did their studies on, uh, you know, back in the 80s on people getting them on treadmill tests and stuff like that, they figured out unless they aggressively and specifically supplemented with sodium, their performance suffered dramatically. They were basically incapable of intense physical exercise if they didn't get enough sodium. Yeah. And we have some other studies that show things like potassium and phosphate, um, nitrogen, which is basically protein, um, studies that you can't do nowadays. So they had people you know, on our intravenous feedings and they were monitoring their, their body compartments, their bone, their fat and their muscle. And they said, what happens if we just completely eliminate sodium from their feeding? Let's see what happens. Okay. So stuff that you couldn't do nowadays. So what happened? So their ability to form muscle tissue dropped by two thirds. Okay. What happens when they took potassium out? Their ability to form muscle tissue dropped by about 100%. Whoa, okay. So these electrolytes and these other substances, they, take, they have a, you know, we, we often pay lip service because we've heard it repeated, oh, electrolytes are important. But when you actually ask people, why do you think electrolytes are important? They can't give you a good answer. They just know, very similar to what you've just said, when you have it, you just feel so much better. And I mean, it's because it's maintenance of intravascular volume. And if you're trying to build more tissue, we, we have these things called intracellular electrolytes, extracellular. We know that inside cells, you have a lot of potassium. So if you're gonna be trying to form new cells, you better be providing the building blocks. This is the same theory as building bone. You can't build bone with calcium alone. You need protein. You can't build new cells of any sorts without all the required ingredients for inside that cell. That includes electrolytes. Right. And that's why giving sodium is good for building bone. So in the Women's Health Initiative study, they actually looked at sodium intake and they found that a low sodium intake was significantly correlated with a higher risk of hip fracture. What, what are your ratios? What do you, how, do you, how do you prescribe the diet? So how do I prescribe the diet? So that's different to what I do because I'm, I'm very much, uh, I eat a lot of food that's probably got enough potassium in it. I put salt on and I put a lot of salt on. If I was eating out, people look at me strange. Mm -hmm. And if I have too much salt, I figure my kidneys will sort it out. Um, for my patients who are, if they're insulin resistant, we know that a lot of people are underdoing magnesium. So there's one study that looked at, um, magnesium in athletes and that we can't reliably assess body levels of magnesium on a blood test. That, that's the problem. And if we do it with the gold standard labeled urine studies and see what comes out in the urine, um, that's just incredibly time consuming and expensive. It's just not practical. But when they have done this type of expensive test in athletes, they found that at least 40% of athletes are actually deficient in magnesium. And magnesium supplementation has been shown to be beneficial with regards to insulin sensitivity and a bunch of other things. It's, a, uh, it's essential for over 300 reactions within the body. So magnesium is pretty high up there for what is often deficient and very low risk for actually supplementing with it. And it also has the other advantage that when you supplement with magnesium, you enhance the body's capacity to hold on to potassium. And that's good because... Potass giving potassium directly is fraught. So if you don't have enough potassium, you can have an arrhythmia, which is an electrical instability of your heart. If you have too much potassium, you can have an arrhythmia. Same problem. So this is why in Australia, we can't, you can't buy potassium over the counter. You have to, be, you have to respect potassium. <laughs> yeah, but the beauty is if you, if you have more magnesium, you enhance your body's capacity to, to address the sodium, the, the potassium levels. So you know, I remember when we used to work in the hospitals and we used to have people going into congestive cardiac failure and we used to always try and get their, their mag over one and their K over four. I mean, there's very good evidence, uh, K, K 
being potassium. Um, that's just our units. Um, because we know that if, if, I ne if I didn't drive up the magnesium level first, or at the same time, I knew I would always be chasing my tail, getting their potassium level into the nice zone. So, but once their magnesium level was up, it was much easier for them to maintain their potassium level. So magnesium is something that I, I actually think from a lot of people, especially if you're not in optimal metabolic health, I think it, it doesn't hurt to take. And then there's a hell of a lot of questions and you talk about which particular formulation, do you want a magnesium aspartate? Do you want a citrate? Do you want, you know, an oxide or, you know, what have you? And probably the only thing I'd say is stay away from the oxide. I mean, that causes diarrhea and loose stools and, it's incredibly poorly absorbed and it's cheap and that's the most common one. Um, you can get one that's chelated with an amino acid, but the problem is the, the magnesium is very small. The amino acid is often very big. So the amount of what we call elemental magnesium that you get in these chelated um, uh, formulations is actually very little. Um, you can get something called magnesium citrate, um, which has much higher doses of magnesium. It's a little bit less uh, uh, diarrhea uh, provoking than uh, the magnesium oxide, but it still can cause it. But at the end of the day, that's probably the one I'll start people on now just because it's cheaper and it's easier to get larger doses. And if you don't tolerate that, then it's reasonable to go to one of these other chelated ones. And I know a lot of people talk about, oh, I need to have three and eight or I need to have uh, aspartate or, or something like this because of the, the other benefit or the orotate because of the, the extra benefit that you get from the amino acid that it's chelated with. But um, I've looked at a lot of that research and I've been pretty underwhelmed, I'll be honest. I don't know if you've got any opinions on that. No, I, I usually try to go with citrate or, you know, and stay away from the oxide because of the diarrhea. But if they're, yeah. if they're constipated, then I say, well, let's try that. <laughs> or you could cut out the fiber. This <laughs> <laughs> is a whole nother conversation. Wow, this is so much fun for me. This is a, a blast. <laughs> this is the best thing in Corona, <laughs> having a conversation with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm enjoying this. I don't often get to speak to an enlightened endocrinologist. <laughs> well, it's, uh, this is fun. This is really fun. But uh, let's hear your thoughts on fiber. Well, the whole notion of, you know, in a nutshell, the problem with constipation is you're trying to pass something through a small hole and fiber makes that something bigger. So how on earth did we think that making something bigger would make it easier to pass through our anal sphincter? And uh, so if you think about it logically, like I'd say, oh yes, but it might be the fluid retention. Nope, not because way back in the 1970s, they actually measured the, the moisture content of stool of people with lots of fiber and stool and people with no fiber in their diet. No difference. So it's not the fluid. So is it the consistency? Nope, not that either. So what is it? It's somebody came up with an idea once, probably to try and sell some cereal. And they basically, you know, pulled the wool over the eyes of most of the doctors who are still practicing today. The, when I was, I was writing a chapter for a, a medical textbook and I was writing the section on fiber and I was trying to go find the original references. And I said, okay, well, this, this will be easy. You know, fiber is good for constipation. I just need to find the reference. I could find guidelines. I couldn't find an original study. So I looked at the study they were citing and they said, okay, fiber increases the size of the stool. And it's like, Sure, we know that, um, but that's patients don't come to me. I've never had a patient come and go, Doc, you know, my, my fecal matter is too small. Do you think you could bulk it out a bit? That's not what people complain about. Other studies on increasing the transit time uh, can help it, you know, passage through the gastrointestinal tract a little bit quicker. Again, I've never had anybody say, you know what, Doc, it's, uh, I've got a 72 hour transit time at the moment. Do you think you could just speed it up a bit? Patients don't care. They care about pain. They care about bloating. They care about bleeding. They care about these things that cause them physical discomfort. So I wanted to, these are the, this is how we diagnose constipation based on symptoms. So I went looking for the research, the science based on the symptoms. And I couldn't find any randomized control trials. There was none. So what I could find, the best experimental study I could find 
um, it was still an experimental design and it had people who were on their normal, they had, I think it was 63 patients um, with idiopathic constipation, which basically means constipation of no known cause, which is what basically most people with constipation will be diagnosed with. They'll say, we don't know why you're constipated, but it's fine, it's normal. So, and some people would say idiopathic refers to the doctor being an idiot or pathetic yeah. or bad, but we'll just say that's what it is. So these guys are already on a relatively high fiber diet on average. So some of them were put on a very high fiber diet. Some of them were put on a medium fiber diet. Some of them were put on a low fiber diet. And then they pulled a rabbit out of the hat. And then they put a bunch of them on a zero fiber diet. So 41 of them actually ended up on a zero fiber diet. So they had like these five symptoms of constipation. Um, and every single participant on the zero fiber diet had complete resolution in all five domains. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. So, and this is the what best the, that we have. Yeah, so uh, what do patients on the carnivore diet report? I understand that they don't have problems with constipation. Is that also? No, well, they sometimes do. They sometimes do. So, the first one is sometimes you have a, a carnivore who uh, doesn't understand the definition or the meaning of the word carnivore. Um, <laughs> as in they're omnivore, um, they're self-labeled incorrectly, but most commonly is cheese, dairy. So the beta casein can be metabolized into an, an opiate-like compound in some people. And we know what the effects of opiates are on the gastrointestinal tract. It, it reduces gastric motility. So there's something about dairy in a subset of the population that seems to uh, be constipation provoking. So if somebody's on a carnivore diet and they're having symptoms of constipation, cutting out dairy is the first thing to try. So maybe you would argue that if they're on a carnivore diet, they wouldn't be on dairy anyway, right? So Well, no, look, I, look I've had a good amount of cheese today and for no other reason than I like it. It's good, so, that's the problem. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy my food. <laughs> what can I say? What about but, um, it's not for everybody, though. It's not for everybody. Right, right. What, but what about the microbiome? You know, you hear all these very smart people arguing that the microbiome needs to be fed uh, and that fiber is, is, is part of the feeding. What, what about yeah. that? So um, there's so many errors to their thinking. The first is correlation and causation. So I often assume that if you have this Bacteroidetes phyla of bacteria in your gut that you will be healthy. And we, some people assume that because you have this phyla, you are healthy. And some people think that because you're eating a healthy diet that makes you healthy, this is the type of bacteria that feed on the foods. And I think the second one is true. When we have a look at epileptics who are on ketogenic diets, we know that by and large, they have a, a predominance of this Bacteroidetes phyla of mm -hmm. bacteria in their gut. And it's not that these bacteria are particularly health promoting, it's that the diet that feeds those bacteria is a low sugar, low carbohydrate, glucose stabilizing diet. So it, this, you know, correlation causation, I think a lot of people are gonna be embarrassed in, you know, a few years time when they look back and this all becomes very obvious. It's also true. I mean, some people say, well, you know, the, you can produce short chain fatty acids from bacterial fermentation of fiber and those short chain fatty acids can be taken up to cells lining the colon and those cells will then convert the uh, short chain fatty acid into a ketone that can be used for energy. And then that colonocyte with more energy can produce mucus and create a protective layer. So you may have noticed the link there between short chain fatty acids going to a ketone before it's used for energy. So why you make the ketones. <laughs> why not be in systemic ketosis? And the reason for this is that fiber is only fermented in a very small part of the colon. And where, where it's fermented and these short chain fatty acids are produced, it's, these short chain fatty acids are only exposed to a very limited population of colonocytes lining the bowel. So if you've got pathology anywhere else in the bowel, then it's not going to do a lick of good. Mm -hmm. But if you're in systemic ketosis and had ketones going around your whole circulation, going around to the whole colon, the whole intestine, 
you'd be in a much, much better position. And then let's not overlook the fact that, you know, feeding bacteria the wrong things can be very dangerous. And we have no better evidence of this than something called Clostridium difficile, which can cause a condition called pseudomembranous colitis. Now, back in the uh, about 2000, some Japanese scientists figured out how to manufacture on an industrial scale a sugar called treholose. Now, this was able to lower the freezing point of dairy, which made it really uh, a, a very nice additive um, for things like ice cream. So it didn't take long for this to take off around the world. I think it was about 2002 or something, it got introduced to the food supply in Australia. And whenever this sugar, trehalose, got introduced, it correlated very nicely with the onset of an epidemic of pseudomembranous colitis. And that's because this bug, this pathogenic bacteria called Clostridium difficile, preferentially feeds off this trehalose where other bacteria, it basically feeding it trehalose allows it to outcompete other bacteria within the gut. It, it does a better job of eating that or fermenting that than other bacteria do. And that's been shown, and this is not weak research, and this is not just me theorising, this was published in Nature. There was a couple of articles in Nature about this. Um, so we have to be careful that we don't want to feed the bad bugs, and that's for sure. Um, but also understand that this whole concept of taking probiotics is just bollocks. Because if I introduce bacteria into my gastrointestinal tract, I've just told you that, you know, if I change the amount of food you eat, you can outcompete or you can cause some bacteria to thrive and basically suppress other bacteria. And that's what happens to probiotics. If you have a ha healthy probiotic, but you don't feed it the right food, they're not going to sustain there. We know that there's studies that show that you can get basically a wholesale change in your microbiome in 24 hours. So basically bacteria die pretty quickly. They outcompete very quickly. And in India, there's a condition called necrolyzing enterocolitis where we have a, basically an infection inside the intestines. It, it happens in um, very young babies and it, it's very dangerous. And they came up with a term called symbiotic because they thought, well, let's try and put in a, um, a probiotic to outcompete the bad bacteria. What happened? Those bacteria were just washed away. They were outcompeted. So then they gave it with another food source that these bacteria could use. So they fed the probiotic and the food source at the same time. So hence the term syn, as in synergistic, uh, for a synergistic effect, symbiotic. And that had a positive effect. So as far as I'm aware, the only real role for probiotics um, from, a, from a health perspective with regards to traveller's diarrhoea is where you need to be taking them in quite large doses and taking them continuously. So basically that they, uh, they sort of uh, suppress any pathogenic bacteria which you might or, or compete with and outcompete any other pathogenic bacteria that you might uh, ingest inadvertently. But if you don't take it, repeatedly or in high doses, then that's useless as well. And it's only ever going to be the short-term effect. And we now have very good evidence that taking probiotics causes gastrointestinal upset in a lot of people as well. So they're not, they're not without side effect. Fascinating. What do you think about uh, artificial sweeteners along those lines? So artificial sweeteners. So if we have a look at the, the polyol class, the sugar alcohol. So the first thing that a lot of people recognise is polyol. I've heard that somewhere before, and that's a P in FODMAPs. So you've heard about this fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyol. These are things that are associated with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so basically, you have this artificial sweetener, which is technically called sugar alcohol, and it gives you the sweet taste in your tongue, nice, but it's non-caloric, so it doesn't really get absorbed by the body. So it passes down to the intestines. So then what? So the bacteria will ferment it instead. What do bacteria do when they ferment it? They produce they gas. They get bloated. And if they don't, if it doesn't, before it gets fermented, it has an osmotic effect, so it draws fluid. So you end up with bloating and diarrhea. And that's why, if you have a look at the packet on uh, diabetic lollies or chewing gum or anything with artificial sweeteners, you'll see the warning. Warning, excess consumption may have a laxative effect. So certainly uh, 
if you're having any gastrointestinal issues, then you should be staying away from artificial sweeteners like the sugar alcohols. And the, as a rule of thumb, if it ends in ol, so sorbitol, you know, xylitol, mannitol, they're, they're all sugar alcohols. Right. But what about, say, stevia? Is that, uh, is that uh, something that, uh, that you recommend? Uh, look, the other problem with artificial sweeteners is addictive eating behaviours. So they, they stimulate the mesolimbic, the mesolimbic pathway. And basically, this is the pathway that rewards us for, uh, you know, we do something, we get this release of dopamine, we feel good, and it makes us want to repeat that behaviour. The problem with artificial sweeteners is that they lead to an activation of this, this pathway as well. So if there's an, an eating behaviour that you're trying to break, um, be it trying to get o overcome an addiction to sweet foods, then the continued consumption of even artificial sweeteners is going to be contributing to that. Absolutely, absolutely. It's incredible how addictive they are. So, well, listen, Paul, I, I, I know it's much later over there, so I should probably let you go to sleep so that you can ex stay on your schedule. <laughs> well, that's true. So, well, thank you for having me on. It's been a blast. So oh, great, super great talking to you. You're a ball of information. It's so much fun. And um, well, we'd love to keep talking in the future. Well, no doubt we will. Let's uh, let's not make it too long. Okay, great. And Thanks hopefully we can drag you all the way to Israel for one of our conferences. Next. I'm there. Probably oh, just not the next month or two. No, no. It's actually scheduled for March 11th and 12th of next year. Let's hope it happens. I think that's good. I mean, look, if. It, I'll, I'll have probably been infected by then. So, yeah, you'll be okay to hop on a plane. I'll That's have great. immunity by then. <laughs> Super. We'd love to host you here. Anyway. I would love to come. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, been an absolute blast. Cool.